We are uh, doing things a little bit differently. We're uh, trying some new things. It's July, it's summer, uh, so uh, we're glad to kind of mix it up a little bit. Um, thanks, Jim and, and Gladys for sharing some about VBC. It's always uh, probably the biggest week of the year around here for us as a congregation. Uh, even despite sort of COVID pandemic and everyone traveling uh, this year who hasn't traveled the last couple of summers, there are about 100 kids that are going to be here this week, which is huge. And we're uh, eagerly anticipating how all that's going to go and gratitude to all the folks who have been a part of uh, getting that ready. Um, we're going to celebrate a couple of birthdays uh, in a minute. Uh, before we do that, I want to uh, invite John Bueno up. John's our special guest with us this morning. I want to say a few things uh, about uh, him before he gets going. Um, we have a, a global missions team as a congregation, and we have a local missions or community outreach team. And between uh, those teams, about 15 to 20 percent, minimum 15 by the end of the year, it's usually closer to 20 or more uh, percent of our budget just kind of goes out the door. We like to think of everything as mission, everything that we do, vacation Bible camp and uh, cancer support group and table gatherings, all of those things could be called mission or ministry. Uh, but we've got sort of local missions or community outreach and in the uh, much bigger degree, what we call global missions. Uh, and that money just goes out the door to partners and people we know and we pray for and support and have worked with all over the world. Uh, there are about a dozen of them, individuals, couples, and families. And we slowly want you to get to know them. A couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, we heard from uh, Dustin, Dusty Ellington, and his wife, Sherry. There's some folks uh, who have been in Africa, Middle East, then Africa, and now back to the Middle East that we support. We want to continue to hold those people in front of you as a congregation so you can know them, so you can catch a vision for what God's doing around the world and how we get to partner, support, and pray for that. Uh, so most of those people are all around the world, and we rarely get to see them or connect with them or hear their stories. Uh, John, among the dozen or so people who is in uh, that portfolio, if you will, of people that we get to partner with, missionaries, uh, is I think you're the only one who's in the United States, but you've spent time ministering as well uh, around the world, especially in Latin America. So we include John as one of those people we're blessed to have as a partner and a supporter, and John's got a unique place having kind of gotten his start here at First Pres. Uh, so John's going to tell us a lot more about that. Glad you're here. Uh, want to wish happy birthday to one of my daughters, Anna, to Marcy, uh, and to Steve. And then I didn't know until this morning, today is your birthday. Yes, it is. Wow. Great timing. So happy birthday to you. Thanks for spending your birthday with us. You've come from Omaha, uh, Nebraska, just for this uh, Talk to us. Tell us about what you're doing right now, what God's called you to, and then you're going to tell us, uh, kind of wind back a few years. Okay. Thank you. It's a real privilege for me to be here, first of all. And it's a real honor and privilege to get to serve the Lord on my birthday. I think that's the greatest gift that the Lord could give me. Um, the one thing that I want to do is I want to emphasize the importance of San Mateo Presbyterian Church in my life and in the ministry that I'm doing. I have been completely blessed by this church and for perhaps more years than most of the people here. I've been blessed and I've been part of this church for 39 years. And the Lord has blessed me through those years with members here that have loved me and given me so much of themselves that I can't even begin to express it. So the first thing I want to do is show my gratitude. But I want to share my story to say this is not what John Buenos accomplished, but to be able to get you to understand that this is what the Lord has accomplished through this congregation. Uh, I learned that the most important thing is to know the difference between religion and relationship. I say my mother was more religious and more Catholic than the Pope. We, we learned about a God that was the creator of the universe. We, we prayed the rosary almost on a daily basis. Uh, I knew about Jesus dying on the cross for me. But I knew about a God that was, and she didn't teach me about a relationship with this God, and she didn't teach me about God being the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And that I learned pretty much here. Uh, I am a commissioned pastor for the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. 
and I have been with them since 2003. I am currently working, and you're going to hear this throughout my story, different denominations, different churches, different places, and it's like, I thought you were Presbyterian. Well, we're Christians, right? So we all work together. So I am currently working with the Lutheran Church. I've been working with them for the last three years to do a Hispanic church plant. Prior to that, I was working with the Evangelical Presbyterian Church in Bellevue, Nebraska, planning a Hispanic church. Uh, prior to that, uh, 2009 thereabouts, I worked with Disciples of Christ denomination, planning a church that is currently running, working beautifully, with a member that was from here, from the San Mateo Hispanic ministry. His name is Danny Zapata, and he's running that ministry. Prior to that is when I was invited to go to, to Omaha uh, as a consultant to do workshops for Hispanic ministry for churches that were in an area that was changing, and the neighborhood changed, but the church did, and so the church declined, and so I was helping uh, doing some Hispanic ministry there. Prior to that, uh, I worked with the Knox Fellowship, which some of you already know. Uh, I worked throughout the country, uh, going to different churches, going to different presbyteries, trying to revitalize the Presbyterian Church. Uh, it was mentored by my very good friend that I love dearly. That he has gone to be with the Lord in the last month, Bob Pitton. Uh, prior to that, I went to Colombia, South America. That's where I'm from, and I wanted to be a missionary in Colombia. So I went to Colombia back in the 90s when the drug cartels were really hitting us hard and the movement, the, the drugs and the violence and the guerrillas were going crazy in the country. And I went to be a missionary to help the pastors that were out in the countryside that were being neglected, being killed. And my goal was to minister to them, send them back out, encourage them. Um, during the time that I was there, unfortunately, my wife got held hostage by the guerrillas, so we ended up coming back to the States. Prior to that, I was right here. Uh, I was a member of San Mateo Press. I began the Hispanic ministry that currently exists. And I was working, ministering to some of the people that live behind what it used to be the racetrack back here, Bay Meadows, they lived behind the stables. They, the horses actually had it better than they did. Uh, ministering to uh, single parents, ministering to some of the homeless. And where did I get all this idea about ministering to these kind of people? And I think this is where the whole thing starts. The Lord has given me a, a, a pretty good schooling throughout the years, and I call it the school of hard knocks. Uh, throughout the years, I learned about how some of those people feel because I've been there, been there, done that. So I know how that goes. So that was the preparation that the Lord did for me. Now let's go back, way back. I was born in Colombia, South America, the youngest of a family of 10. My father was an alcoholic, came from a very dysfunctional family. We were well-to-do, but by the time I came along, um, everything was gone. I can remember being a child and my mother sending me to the next door neighbor's house to steal the meaty bones that they were feeding to the dogs. They had a meat market or something. And my mom would wash them and prepare food for us, soup. The Lord got me out of that, brought me to this country back in 1965, came to Marin County, had never stepped in a school because my father was too proud to put me in a public school. They put me in seventh grade. Didn't know how to read or write in Spanish, let alone in English. Didn't know how to speak English. Nobody knew how to speak Spanish, but I just sat there. Nevertheless, if there's anybody here that, can, that I think is young and can understand, if anybody could be cruel, it's children. 
They let me know that I was different. They let me know that I was not wanted or accepted. And I learned that being myself and being Hispanic was nothing to be proud of. Yet I go home and my family would say, you're the only one in our family that has the opportunity to get an education in the United States and you're wasting it. I didn't get much of an education. I started working as a janitor, moved on up, ended up driving a truck, getting married at almost 18 years old, running away from being Hispanic, running away from my family, running away from everything. Became a workaholic, a truck driver, driving 24-7, taking drugs to stay awake, neglecting my marriage. Got home one day, middle of the night. My front door was open, the lights were on, the music was playing, nobody home. My daughter, my little girl, had cried herself to sleep on the floor with a dirty diaper. And I said, Lord, why? I don't get it. I don't understand what's going on. Life continued like that. I would find myself driving, pulling off to the side of the road, getting underneath my trailers, and crying out to God. I said, I want to be different than my father. I want to have a life. I want to give my daughter something. But I don't see it happening. Shortly after that, I walked into a church one day, a Catholic church, sat in the back pew. It was a weekday, sat in the back and said, God, when I was a little boy, I was an altar boy. I want to serve you, even if it's just collecting the offering. And I want to have a family. That's all I want. For the first time in my life, I felt something different, that I know what it is now, but I didn't then. It was the Holy Spirit letting me know that he had heard my prayer. Got a divorce after that, tried to begin a new relationship. It wasn't working out. But remember this, guys, the Lord always has a way to bring us back to those places we don't want to be, that perhaps need a lot of inner healing. The person that reached out to me as a single parent and a truck driver was a Hispanic man that I didn't like Hispanics. And he opened the doors of his home for me to live with them. They would take care of my daughter while I drove. They invited me to come to a church activity, December 17, 1983. Southern California, Chino, California, Methodist Church, some kind of Christmas activity. And I was like, I don't like Hispanics. I'm Catholic. Okay, I live there, so I got to go. So I went. Don't ask me what the the message was about, because I have no clue. What I do know is that in the middle of the message, the minister said, gave an example. He said, there was a man, and I like those, because it kind of helps me visualize a man that fell off a cliff and there was a tree there like a branch of a tree and he held on to that and he screamed for hours help 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 would somebody please help me nobody there finally he gave up he says if there's a god please help me then he heard a voice there is a god and i will help you Let go of the branch. Man said, is there anybody else there? (laughs) As funny as it sounds, what the minister said was, we cry out to God with our problems. We cry out to God with the things that lead us away from God. And we hold on to those things tight. And we say, God, help us. And God says, trust me. And we never do. 
That day I came forward and I said, Lord, rebuild my life with the foundations of Jesus Christ. Rebuild my life. Mold me. Make me. Shape me. Use me. Guide me. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you something here. You got to be careful what you pray for because God does answer prayer. Shortly after that, I moved to San Mateo and I went to the Lutheran church on El Camino in 92. And I said to the pastor, I'm on fire for the Lord. I'm looking for a church. I just got here and here I am. He said, the church you're looking for is not this one. <laughs> Why? I don't know. But he did say, Hacienda and 25th, check that one out. And by the way, I went back a couple of years later and I thanked them immensely. I came into this church on a Wednesday night, about 7 o'clock. I was walking through the hallways out here where the patio is. And a man came out. He said, can I help you? I said, yes. My name is John and I'm looking for a church. He said, welcome home, brother. You're home. And he took me in to the Iona room. They were having a Bible study on the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit. And he let everybody know that I was looking for a church. And I felt right at home. And that's where the whole thing kind of began. I had people, I was as broken as broken can get. I was hungry for the Lord. I was searching. I needed help. And I learned real early that there are three essential things that I needed. One, I needed to be in relationship with God. It's not about religion. Religion was what my mother gave me. That's all she knew. But I needed to be in relationship with my Lord because he hasn't changed any. He's still alive and he's alive and well right here within my own heart. Number two, the body of Christ is the church. I needed to attach myself to the body. I needed to function under the leading of the Spirit. And I found the body of Christ, the San Mateo congregation. And number three, I began to search for what some of us haven't found yet. What is the purpose of my existence? Why did God create me? And why did God even save me if it's not for his use? So I begin to search for that. I think when I walked in here at this church, many of times I think people would see me and they walk the other way. Because it wouldn't take long for me to say, Hi, uh, I'm John. Could you pray for me? And be, Okay, okay. And then I get down praying with that person. Could you pray for me? Um, I need a job. Could you pray for me? I need this. Can you pray? And, and people would probably go nuts. But nevertheless, people begin to minister to me. A lady that was praying with me, she began to tutor me, and she was the, the head of the prayer team. She got me a job. There was a man that came up to me and said, hey, John, uh, how about a Bible study? And I said, I'm a single parent. I begin my day about 7 a.m., and I get out of work. I pick up my daughter. Then I got to feed her. I got to do this stuff that parents do, and then after that, I put her to bed, and I'm ready for bed myself, and that's my day, and I don't have time for a Bible study. He says, what time do you go to work? He says, 7 o'clock, 7 a.m. He says, great. I'll see you at 6. I'll bring the donuts. You make the coffee. He began to, to mentor me. People would pray for me right here. People would invite me into their home to have dinner with them. People would invite my daughter to spend the night with them. People would say, you know, you need a day off. Let your daughter pray with our kids, and then you'd take off and have some time to yourself. And I was like, what's wrong with those people? Why are they being so nice? I don't get it. There's something wrong here. I still was broke, and I lost my job. I was a workaholic, remember? I lost my job, and I couldn't get a job driving anymore. And that was my pride. I was, I was a provider. I didn't have that anymore. I had to sell my car, and I loved my car. It was a 1970 Mustang. And I had to sell my car to pay the bills. Somebody gave me a car. And I'm struggling, and I'm going, Lord, I gave everything up to follow you, and, and I know things are working out, but... 
but things are getting rather rougher than better. I don't get it. And so somebody came up to me, and they were praying for me, and then uh, somebody came up and said, you know, the Lord laid on my heart to give you this money, and they gave me a bunch of money, and I paid my bills, and I had a, a car now. It wasn't a Mustang. It was a station wagon, but that's okay. And somebody said, you know, your daughter needs a pet. I said, okay. How about if we buy her a little parakeet or something? I said, okay, great. So the man came into my home and brought the parakeet. And he says, John, you have a one-bedroom apartment. Don't you need a two-bedroom apartment? Your daughter needs to have her own room. And I said, yeah, but I can't afford it yet. He gave me an envelope full of checks. He said, this should last you about a year. When you run out of these, if you still can't make it, you let me know. Move into a two-bedroom apartment, all my moves, everything was paid for, my deposits and everything. I continue to thrive on what this church was doing for me. They were, they were meeting my spiritual needs, they were meeting my physical needs, they were meeting my emotional needs, they were meeting all of my needs. I come to the church and I meet somebody and they say, well, it's getting close to Christmas. We're going to go cut down our own Christmas tree. We do that as a tradition with the family. We, we like to invite you to come with us and we'll get you a Christmas tree. Great. So I went, got a Christmas tree, came to the church office. The administrator said, you know, somebody came in here and left this bag, a bag about that big, full of Christmas decorations. We don't know who to give it to, so why don't you take it? And if you can use it, praise the Lord. And if you can, give it to somebody else. God bless you. Merry Christmas. So now I got a Christmas tree decorated. I got my house. I got my bills paid. I got a car. I got everything. I was like, wow, I can't believe this. This is incredible. I come to church right before Christmas. And as I was walking in front of the church, a man came up to me. And said, Merry Christmas. Gave me a present and my daughter a present. It was at that very moment that I knew that the prayer that I had done a year prior, God had answered. I was in the hands of my maker. He had taken away the family that I was trying to put together that was wrong. He had taken my job my pride, everything that I had created, he stripped me of all of it. And he was rebuilding my life through the body of Christ, the San Mateo Presbyterian Church. They were meeting all of my needs. You cannot imagine the joy of feeling and knowing that you're in your maker's hand, that you're receiving from God and that God is answering your prayers and healing your wounds. And by the way, I learned to love Hispanics. <laughs> I was loving what I was doing and receiving. And a man came up to me and he burst my bubble. He said, John, it's time. Time for what? He said, you've been on the receiving end. It's time for you to start giving. I go, what am I going to give? Who am I? I'm, I'm, I'm a truck driver. I'm a nobody. I, I have nothing to give. He says, God will use each one of us as members of the body in different dimensions and different ways. God can use you as you are. Make yourself available and allow the Lord to do the work that the Lord wants to do through you. And that's how my ministry began, through this church. That's how it all began, through the work of the body of Christ. Now, you will hear people saying, the world's a mess. This is happening, that's happening. Where's God in all this? The question that I ask myself and I ask you is, where are we? We are the body of Christ. God died for us when we were lost. What does God expect of 
us to be in relationship with Him, to be a body, to go out into the community as you guys are doing with BBS, reaching out to people, and to understand that we have a heavenly, a kingdom purpose on this earth. And I will finish it with this. I call this my entire life story, the rotten apple story. Because, see, I have had horrible experiences in my lifetime. But I believe that God gave me those opportunities to learn so that I can minister to those people that are hurting and that are there. I wouldn't know how to deal with it if I hadn't been there. So when I see youth struggling, when I see single parents struggling, when I see... Hispanics struggling, I can relate to them. See, the rotten apple story is simple. Everybody that looked at me saw my rough edges, the bruises that rejected me. God saw the seeds within me, and he picked me, and he planted me, and the loving and caring soil of the First Presbyterian Church of San Mateo. And he watered me with your prayers, with the power of the Holy Spirit. I have been, remember, my vision was to collect the offering. I have been through probably 80% of the Latin American countries on mission trips. I have even been all the way out to Africa, and a brother said to me one time, what are you doing going to Africa? There's no Hispanics in Africa. I said, yeah, I know, but the last time I checked, Matthew 28, 18 says to go to the end of the earth, and to me, that's the end of the earth. So I'm going to go minister to these folks. And I did. And you know what? I don't need to be a minister. You don't need to be anything special. I went to South Sudan to serve as a handyman in a clinic, in a medical clinic. And I stayed there three to four months. Before I returned, 16 of the people on that staff had accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I have had the privilege of having my own family members, my own brother, that I held his head on my left hand and my right hand on his heart and led him into the presence of the Lord. I have led people into a relationship with Christ. And today I say to you, my, mon my Monday morning or morning prayer is, thank you, Lord, for my salvation, for the gift that could not be bought for nothing on the face of this earth that I need to guard and protect. And Lord, allow me to do kingdom business with my life until the day you call me home. Thank you, San Mateo Presbyterian Church. Thanks for sharing. Uh, and so this is part of why uh, John can also preach. But his uh, story, his journey, and God's grace in his life is a hundred sermons all rolled into one uh, about, uh, yeah, God's goodness to you and in you and through you, and also a testimony to the church universal and specifically to how this church has been able to live into its call. Um, John has a lot more stories, actually, and you could go deeper. Uh, I'm not sure you said, uh, but that envelope of checks was blank checks. And the person who's uh, a part of this congregation still handed over a dozen blank checks with no limit or expectation about what would be written into those one day. That reminds me of our value of serving our neighbors generously. If that's not generous, I don't know what is. And you receive that graciously and have uh, turned that around uh, and been incredibly gracious to 
people all over the world, in Nebraska and in here. And so we celebrate that uh, with you and in you uh, with much gratitude. John's got uh, amazing stories about uh, being a single parent uh, in Southern California, about the, the challenges that that was in his life and how God uh, continued to provide uh, the car, even though it was a station wagon. <laughs> My first automobile was a station wagon. Yeah, understand. So uh, we thank God for you. Uh, thanks for making time to be with us. John's going to be around after worship. Uh, if you'd like to pray with him or for him, uh, I suggest that uh, if you're okay with that, that we ask you to stand out in the middle of the congregation, that we pray with gratitude for you and uh, what God's going to do in the next chapter of your life in Nebraska and beyond. Will that be okay? Yes. All right. Thank you. Thanks for... If you want to put your hands on John, he's not shy on his shoulders, on his head. <laughs> and let's uh, pray for him. I'm going to push you that way toward the middle of the... Thank you, God, for the reminders uh, in John and through John of your grace and of your power and of your desire and your will, that you're relentless, that you won't let go. Uh, that you won't give up, uh, that the world may see bad apples, rotten apples, but you see seeds and you see possibilities. And uh, you, in love, see beloved children who have value and who are made in your image. We thank you that he was, is, and will always be one of those people. We praise you for the ways that uh, the seeds in John's life have been multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and continue to bear fruit. We ask that you would teach us through his story and through him what it means to love and to uh, lean into and to trust and to let go of the branches and the things that we hold on to so tightly instead of uh, trusting you. Help us in that regard. Have mercy on John. Uh, Continue to use him for your purposes. Uh, Continue to expand and multiply what you would have uh, done through your kingdom and in your kingdom. We pray these things with confidence and with gratitude and with hope and with eager expectation and joy. In the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen.